My name is Alec Gerlach. Um, uh, I'm the Vice President for Communications at C2ES. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll begin with some comments from C2ES President Nat Cohen, Nat, Nat Cohen uh, regarding C2ES work in the area of international dialogue, as well as an update on U.S. efforts to reach its nationally determined contributions. Uh, Nat's an economist with more than 20 years of energy and environmental policy experience. Uh, before coming to C2ES a bit over a year ago, uh, he served as senior vice president for climate and climate with the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, where he led the research and policy advocacy on climate change in the U.S. and globally. In 2011 through 2012, uh, Cohan served in the White House as special assistant to the president for energy and environment in the National Economic and D D Domestic Policy Council helping to shape administration policy on energy and environmental issues. Uh, following Nat's remarks, uh, C2S Vice President for International Strategies, Kaveh Gilampur, will offer a briefing on the goals of COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh and some insights how to, on how to determine the degree to which it succeeds. So uh, Kaveh joined us in, uh, in 2021, coming from the UN. Uh, he has over 20 years working in environmental and climate change issues, uh, Kave has had uh, various roles, including uh, legal advisor on the on the UK and EU's climate change negotiating teams, the UK's head of UNFCCC negotiations, a lead negotiator on climate change for the European Union, as well as for the, the Alliance of Small Island States, um, served with the Sec Secretariat of the High Ambition Council Coalition, and principal advisor on climate change to the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Before joining C2ES, Kave served two years as a senior member of the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Team. Uh, before I pass it to Nat, just a couple of points for housekeeping. Um, this session is being recorded and will be posted on C2ES's YouTube channel later today. I'll try to send around a link as soon as it's available to help for your stories. Um, following Nat and Kave's comments, we'll open things up to questions. Um, to ask questions, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom control panel. Um, Please keep your, keep your mics muted uh, to avoid background, background noise until I recognize you for questions. And uh, following Nat and Kame, Kaveh's comments, uh, Nat's available to answer questions on the intersection of, of the COP and UN negotiations with US policy. And Kaveh can speak to expect, expectations for COP27 and global uh, reactions. Uh, one last note for me, Nat and Kaveh will both be in Egypt next week. Please keep in touch uh, with us as you're looking for quick reaction or explanations of what's happening. Uh, you can reach me anytime at gerlacha at c2es.org or at plus one five one seven two one four seven four one five. Thank you. Nat, go ahead. Thanks, Alec, and thanks everybody for joining. I will be relatively brief um, because I know Kave has the I want to hand the mic to Kaveh to talk about COP27. Um, and as Alex said, we'd be happy to talk uh, to, to have questions and Q&A afterwards if there are specific questions about the US and US policy. But I'll just say very briefly uh, about where C2S comes into this debate and then a couple of quick top line points about the US as it comes into Sharm el-Sheikh. So C2S, as, as many of you know, has been holding international dialogues. We convene heads of delegation from over 30 countries um, several times a year. Uh, and we do that, and we have been doing that for about 12 years, I think. Uh, we that, that work was part of the lead up into the Paris Agreement, Paris Framework, and was widely credited with helping to create space and ideas and consensus around what became the Paris Framework, um, the Paris Agreement in 2015. And then we've, and we've continued to do it since uh, with helping to create landing zones and consensus around the Paris rulebook negotiations, and we continue going forward with all the issues in the Glasgow work program that Cave will talk about. So that gives us, those are all Chatham House, and of course we're, those, those part of the, the importance of that and the magic of that is the providing a safe space, but it does give us, and particularly Cave and his team, I think particular insight into um, where the negotiations are going, but also the broader context. And I know Cave will talk a lot about the action agenda at this year's COP and the need to shift from the previous focus on negotiations over text and, and towards a focus on action on the action agenda, especially with the with eyes to the global stock take next year. So that's a little bit about C2ES and our role and, and, and the insights that we bring. And, and we'll have a big team, I think, of seven or so on the ground 
uh, in Charm next week. I will just say briefly, all of you, I think, well, many of you um, are familiar with the US context, but many of you are not. We have a really terrific and very broad group of folks on the phone. So I just wanna say very briefly to set the stage, um, where does, how does the US come into this COP? Uh, and how does the US come into and show up at COP27? Last year, we all we, we saw how, and I talked with many of you in advance and we saw it at in Glasgow, we saw how important it was for the US to have that reinvigorated global diplomacy and that stance that the US was taking all throughout 2021 after President Biden came in, the re-entry into the Paris Agreement, the establishment of a very ambitious um, nationally determined contribution of 50 to 52% below 2005 emissions by 2030, and then the vigorous diplomacy that the uh, Biden administration and Secretary Kerry put in place um, to get other countries also to up their ambition, to come forward with more ambitious NDCs in advance of the Glasgow, and also to pull together new coalitions like the Methane Pledge and like the First Movers Coalition. So we saw how valuable that was last year. This year, of course, it's hard to keep up all that momentum, but there's something similar in the IRA. Now, we can talk more about the Inflation Reduction Act in question and answer and the details of it, but there's no question that it's an enormous step forward in the right direction for the United States to um, drive the technology innovation and development and deployment that it needs to meet our 2030 target. Many of you are familiar with the modeling. A range of models uh, suggest that the emissions, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, with that in place and other policies that are in place, um, we, the, that emissions for the United States as a whole are projected to be 32 to 42%, so high 30s, as high as 42% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, and I think there's a big push to make sure we're at the high end of that range. So getting to 40 to 42% with policies in place is a big step forward relative to where we were eight months ago, even six months ago. And that will be really important to, to, have, to help John Kerry and his team, and even the president when he comes, come into Sharm el-Sheikh, showing that the US is moving, is putting in place the policies it needs um, to move towards its nationally determined contribution. Having said that, it's also the case, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, that more will need to be done on the US front to get all the way to 50 to 52%. So we're not done yet, and we shouldn't rest on our laurels thinking that we've done everything we need to. And I also want to emphasize that from the rest of the world's perspective, I think they will welcome the US uh, policy move and, and the, the actions taken by Congress and the president uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act and everything else the, in the Infrastructure Bill, CHIPS Act, and so on. They will welcome that to the extent that it helps the US meet its commitment. But in a sense, that's table stakes for the United States coming into Sharm el-Sheikh. That's exactly what we and every other country are supposed to do. We're supposed to set a target, we're supposed to make it ambitious. And then we are, in fact, we're bound, legally bound by the Paris Agreement to pursue policies to meet those commitments. So to some extent, for all the fanfare and the deserved celebration around the Inflation Reduction Act and all the other the legislation that's been passed and the progress that's been made, uh, as I said, that's just the sort of expected uh, steps that a country like the US should take uh, and so there is much more that needs to be done, both internationally and domestically, along the way. But I, but I do think it gives the U.S. the needed momentum and the needed demonstration of seriousness that it had to have uh, to be in good position coming into Sharm El Sheikh. So with that, um, let me pass it to Kali. Kali. Um, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Nat, and uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, Alec, great. Thank you for putting that on the screen. Um, I just wanted to give some visuals to sort of uh, to mark the main points I was going to make here. So we're just going to have a quick look at ahead to COP27 and to sort of explore what we might expect and what the sort of challenges uh, will be there. So next slide, please. All right. Yep. So I'm going to um, essentially run first through this, the challenges. And as, as you all know, this COP is faced with some pretty uh, unique geopolitical and economic challenges. We have the situation with Ukraine, the energy crisis, the food crisis, and also, of course, many countries around the world still um, struggling. Um, previous slide, please. Thank you. Um, and many countries uh, still struggling with the after effects and continuing uh, impacts of the COVID-19 pa pandemic, which in, in, the, in the global north, we are 
um, recovering from, but it's still very much ravaging other countries around the world. So those are the, the kind of geopolitical headwinds that we have coming in. And then in terms of the actual COP itself, we're faced with a, a COP that's very different from a COP like Paris or COP26 in Glasgow, where there were very specific and high profile deliverables. For this COP, we have a situation where the mandated deliverables under the agenda are actually quite far and few between in terms of headlines. One is the mitigation work program, which is essentially a work program which will last uh, all, um, all through the through this decade to try and halve emissions through to 2030. And then we have a uh, an agenda item, which is called the Santiago Network on Loss and Damage, which essentially is a, a networking and capacity building and technology sharing um, network on loss and damage. Both of these uh, agenda items, when operationalized, won't yield immediate results. So they're not going to be making probably the headlines of your various news outlets if they're agreed. Um, on top of that, we're going into this COP um, off the back of not very encouraging news in terms of ambition of the headline targets of NDC. So as you would have seen from this recent reports of the UNFCCC or uh, synthesis report, the, the world has not responded uh, as uh, ambitiously as it should have done to the call from Glasgow to raise the headline targets in its NDCs. I think the good news is that with every COP that we've had since Paris, the um, the emissions reductions are going in the right direction. So we are starting to bend the curve from the trajectory that it was going in, but that is not happening fast enough in order to be compliant with a 1.5 trajectory. Um, we also have a situation where the, uh, the developed countries have failed to deliver on the 100 billion on climate finance. We also have a promise to double adaptation finance. Neither of these uh, have been met yet, and that doesn't really create a, a great atmosphere for the negotiations. But even if all of those things were not there as challenges, I think the biggest challenge that is going to be faced by this negotiation, and I would also say probably from the perspective of the media, is that this is really the first COP that is genuinely uh, at the forefront of the pivot from negotiations to implementation. And what I mean by that is that we have the Paris Agreement that was adopted in 2015, it's entered, in, entered into force. And at COP26, we have had the finalization of the most of the rule book for the Paris Agreement. So there's no real big treaty related negotiations left. And what we are faced now with is the very hard work of actually implementing promises made. And that's very technical, it's very complicated, and it doesn't really make headlines. And I think that's a, a major challenge that's going to be faced by the COP27 presidency, because unfortunately, COPs so far have been very much geared around the drama of last minute negotiations. And this COP really needs to be one which is about delivering on implementation. So next slide, please. In terms of opportunities, I think there's some good things uh, and, uh, and some positives. One is that the fact that world leaders are being convened at uh, the COP is, is a great sign. Uh, it's, I understand President Biden will be going and will be joined by a number of world leaders throughout the time in Sharm el-Sheikh. I think Egypt is hoping for some 100 world leaders to show up. And just the fact that they are doing that in the current geopolitical climate and economic situation um, really does suggest a, a success in terms of keeping climate at the top of the political agenda around the world, and that's important. The other thing is that the Egyptian COP presidency is highly experienced. They have very experienced lead negotiators who have been in the process for a number of years, and the COP president himself, the foreign minister, is a very seasoned diplomat who's been in post for over a decade. So again, that bodes well to navigate the process in Sharm el-Sheikh. The focus on implementation comes at the right time, uh, and that combined with the action agenda, which is going to be very um, packed at the COP with a number of thematic days throughout the COP and announcements being delivered throughout the two weeks, really does bode well, potentially, for this pivot to negotiation. And finally, I would also say, really echoing what the point that Nat made, is that Paris does have a binding, legally binding requirement for 
countries to try to put in place the measures and policies and legislation to implement their targets. And the US has gone a long way to doing that with the IRA. Um, the European Union is doing that with its 50, Fit for 55, and a number of countries around the world are also doing that. And we really need to see a focus on delivery of promises and not just target setting. And then next slide, please, Alec. So what would success look like? In brief, I would say a good participation of a significant number of world leaders, agreement on what is mandated to be delivered at this COP, which while it's not headline making, it's important. So the mitigation work program and the Santiago network on loss and damage, we need to find a way forward on finance for loss and damage. So this is the issue of this additional agenda item proposed by developing countries. It's the contentious issue of whether or not to have a standalone finance facility for loss and damage agreed at this COP, or whether that should be something to be considered later. We need to find a way forward on that, and I think that's possible. The presidency has done a lot of outreach on that. We need to see significant announcements from world leaders in the action agenda, including civil society, businesses, and subnational entities from around the world really showing that things are moving on the ground. And not to be forgotten, um, we are seeing the second technical dialogue of the global stock take this year at the COP. And this is preparation for what is known as the five-year ambition cycle of the Paris Agreement, which culminates next year at COP28. And that's what's going to form, inform the next round of uh, enhancement of ambition of countries' targets. So it's really important that that global stock take um, takes that forward. So I would um, I would sort of uh, end there. I would echo what Alex said, that we have a number of resources. He shared uh, in the chat our landing page for COP27. We'll keep that updated. And Alec and the, and the comms team will be sharing throughout the two weeks um, intelligence and, and news that we have from the negotiations. So thanks very much, Alec, and um, back to you. Thanks, Kabe. Uh, so you know, uh, we wanted to reserve much of this time that we have reserved here for questions from uh, from you all about what to expect and and what we're going to see. So, um, if you would have a question for Kabe or Nat, please uh, use the raise hand function, and uh, I will recognize you, and you you can unmute yourself and and raise that question. Uh, Jen, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I, I mainly was hoping you all could give me an, an overview of kind of the possible outcomes at the agenda stage for the loss and damage item. You know, uh, does it have to have uh, a funding or facility kind of referenced as a possible end game in the actual agenda item? And uh, is that uh, is that going to be kind of a, a, a something that the G77 is, is going to insist on? If you could maybe speak about even the contours of what we'll see in that first day in the first plenary. Sure, I'm. I'm happy to come in on that, Alec. Um, so, I mean, on that point, the 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 COP27 presidency has done a lot of outreach and diplomacy to try to find a smooth landing for this. It's really important that the COP does land smoothly because, frankly, there's a lot of expectations for this COP, and the world just doesn't understand how uh, a process like this would open with with what is you know, potentially a pretty obscure procedural issue. So the presidency has done a lot of outreach on this. And my view is the, the landing zone will be around agreeing an agenda item, but I don't think that the conditions are there yet to actually agree to have a, a, a new finance facility. And there's there's one there's one main reason for that. And I think that's because the COP26 launched something called the Glasgow Dialogue, which is a two-year process to ex essentially explore issues around finance for loss and damage. And I think developing countries were right to be dissatisfied um, with that dialogue because essentially it has no connection to the political level and it has no strong mandate to deliver recommendations that will be enacted upon. So it, it risks being a talk shop. And I think agreeing an agenda item on this issue could strengthen that mandate and allow the dialogue to do its work and come back with recommendations that then will be enacted upon. As I say, I don't think the political conditions are there to actually agree to a new finance facility now because 
important questions haven't been answered, such as what value add would such a facility have over existing facilities? And another important question is, how long would it take to set up? If we look back to the Green Climate Fund, that took over five years of negotiations from uh, agreeing to setting that up to actually it being operational. And it's only just getting to the stage now where it's beginning to function properly. So there's really also questions about what would be the most effective and efficient way forward. So I think we will agree an agenda item. I don't think it will be as narrow as just as a question on, fi uh, on finance. I think it will also look at issues um, such as how to minim minimize and avert loss and damage as well, um, not just how to deal with it financially once it arises. So I hope that uh, that answered your question. Thanks. Uh, that And that was Jen with Bloomberg. Sorry, I forgot to introduce you. Um, so if, uh, as I recognize folks, if you can also introduce you, yourself and your publication, that would be wonderful as well. Uh, and with that, I'll ask uh, Cheryl to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, I'm Cheryl Hogue with Chemical and Engineering News. And I have a question about the, how the war in, in Ukraine is going to be affecting the negotiations and how people are talking, especially with the short term need for natural gas, uh, especially in Europe. I know that there's a long term plan to, to move away from that. Um, but I know that some of the African countries, not all of them, are concerned about uh, the move to get more uh, fossil fuel infrastructure specifically for natural gas so that they can become uh, gas exporters. Um, and is that affecting, uh, is that one of the geopolitical uh, things happening in the COP and how do you think that'll be addressed? I think this is probably for Kabe. Sure, I can come in and, uh, and Alec can, uh, uh, Nat can come in as well. I, I think it's a really good question. I mean, first of all, I would say that the it is a it is a geopolitical context that's important, um, but interestingly, that, that these issues didn't really directly perme permeate the atmosphere or the conduct of the negotiations uh, in the UNFCCC in June in the sort of preparatory meetings for the COP. Um, a, a lot has been made about what the situation means for the European climate targets uh, in terms of the energy situation in Europe, for example. And th the fact is that the, the European Union has a legally binding commitment towards net zero emissions by 2050, and it has legislation in place to back that up. And the European Commission has actually come forward with proposals to accelerate its transition to renewable energy. So in many ways, the current situation is accelerating that transition um, certainly it has it's, it's it's having that effect in the EU. So while there might be bumps in the road, the overall trajectory in the EU, which is most directly impacted by this, is in the right direction. And they decoupled emissions from economic growth a long time ago. And there's nothing to indicate that that's a trend that is in any way going to be changing. You're right that a, a number of countries are considering using natural gas as a, as a transition fuel. Um, I think an important conversation needs to be had as to how um, those countries can be assisted to leapfrog that step, um, because in many parts of the world, uh, renewables are much more competitive than their fossil fuel counterparts in terms of rolling out energy rapidly. Um, but there's a lot more issues there than just economics. And of course, the assistance from the developed world to help the uh, developing world to transition in a way that minimizes emissions is going to be really important here. Um, I don't know if Nat also wants to wanted to come in on that. I'll just add very quickly um, in terms of a broader context, and I agree with what Kave said. I think you know one interesting aspect of in, in not sort of not in the negotiating rooms themselves, but if we think more broadly about the climate context, um, there's been so much focus on. Europe and European emissions and the, what, what happens if Europe shifts, you know, Germany shifts back to, to, to using some of its coal plants and so on. And I think there are lots of, there, there are a whole range of reasons that it's not a good thing for Germany to be raising its coal uh, use. But on the other hand, as Kabe said, that is all under a cap. It's important to recognize that Europe has those policies in place. So I don't think anybody is worried about, or at least uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think we, we're worried that the um, that the this immediate challenge which Europe has responded to and I know is driving significant challenges in terms of energy prices and so on in Europe but 
that doesn't look like it's going to derail at all the European uh, focus. In fact, to the contrary, as Kave said, it, uh, it's accelerating that focus. So I, I think in terms of the bigger context, one thing that the Ukraine crisis, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the resulting energy crisis is underscoring is the need, this is picking up on another thing Kave said, to make sure that developing countries have the finance um, not only to accelerate use of renewables, but especially to phase out the use of existing coal-fired power capacity. The, the real concern that, that, you, that one has about the natural gas being you know, diverted towards, uh, towards Europe in order to meet its needs in the immediate term after Russia's cut off the gas and so on, the immediate concern would be if that led perversely to greater use of, and, and investment in coal uh, in other parts of the world in particular Southeast and South Asia. And so I think that's a real need for a focus to make sure that uh, finance and support is, is being directed at accelerating coal phase out and retirements rather than uh, allowing this current crisis to have the opposite effect. Thanks, Nat. Uh, so I think our next question is from, from Nirmal. Hi, this is Nirmal Ghoshia from The Straits Times. I'm wondering if we should be worrying about the midterm elections in the United States. And if the administration loses its majority in Congress, will that be a sort of a, a drag? <clears throat> or put another way, is there how much scope is there for the US in the US if that happens for implementation and commitments to be, if not reversed, watered down? How much scope is there for that? Yeah, thanks, Nirmal. It's a great question, and I'm sure one that's on other minds as well. Um, so the, the short answer is that in the near term, in other words, over the next two years, the results of this midterm election will have very little effect on the policies that get into play, that, that are put into place and, and the implementation of Inflation Reduction Act. But as I'll return in a minute, the 2024 election, of course, would, would have more significant effect. But the reason that the midterms won't have significant impact is, is a couple fold. Uh, one is just the structure, which will be familiar to you and many others, but worth just re re refreshing since you don't spend all your time thinking about US Washington uh, you know, process the way we do. Um, even, if the mid, even if the Republican party were to take both houses of Congress, which is certainly in play, so both the House and the Senate, it will not have a veto-proof majority. And so President Biden will be able to veto any legislation that uh, the Congress might pass. So even if Congress, and I don't think it will for reasons I'll say in a minute, but even if Congress wanted to try to roll back over the next two years to roll back some of the investments and the policies that have been put in place, it would be very difficult for Congress to do that uh, simply because President Biden has a majority. Um, there's a couple of, I mean, it has a veto, sorry. There's a couple of additional points to raise. One is, I don't think that the Republicans will see it as being in their interest uh, genuinely to try to roll back the provisions in the infrastructure bill or in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it may be, maybe the corporate tax rate, which is, for those of you who follow the Inflation Reduction Act, it was mostly a climate bill. It also had some prescription drug benefits and it had a hike in the corporate tax rate. It might well be that Republicans would go after that. Um, maybe they would try to tie that to some you know, procedural issues to, to try to force that through. I think it's unlikely that the Republicans would actually take steps to roll back the, um, the tax credits and incentives for clean energy that were in the Inflation Reduction Act, because I, I don't think anyone is clamoring for that. You might see you know, railing against it, and I'm sure there'll be lots of political talk and rhetoric, but I, I don't expect that, that would be a focus for the Republicans. Um, and then finally, a final point I'll make, and then, and then two more about sort of where I think we're, we're headed, but a final point that, that gives me uh, assurance that the next two years aren't going to see some kind of rollback. I was in the White House in 2011, 2012, immediately after the midterm elections where President Obama lost his majority in Congress and the Republicans came in. And we've seen, we saw then, and we've seen again and again, it is just very politically difficult um, to roll back broader environmental protection. So for example, if you said, okay, Nat, you, the Inflation Reduction Act, that's fine, but what about Clean Air Regulations or Clean Air Act and so on? It is just, those are very popular laws. Um, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, safeguards, health standards, and so on, those are very popular. And it's proven very hard for Republicans to get the votes to, for, for the, the Republicans who want to, to get the votes to pull those back. So even if you thought the broader agenda in terms of the regulatory agenda might be at direct risk, I, I don't think it will be 
even if Republicans take both houses of Congress. Now, there are two things that I want to say that we that we will lose, right? If if the Republicans take both houses of Congress, I don't think anybody expects them to have high on their agenda additional policy steps that might be needed, um, both to make sure that our, the Inflation Reduction Act lives up to its promise and to get additional reductions that we're going to need by 2030. If you have a divided Congress, it's possible to imagine it still feels probably unlikely given the recrimination and the acrimony, but it's possible to imagine some steps forward on things like permitting and so on, permitting reform. But if the Republicans take both houses, I don't think we'll see anything except for impeachment proceedings and the like. So that will freeze everything. So we certainly won't make any progress. And then the final point I will make is the 2024 elections will matter tremendously um, because a president in power with a congressional majority can do much more in terms of rolling back legislation. I, I still don't think they would want to roll back lots of the provisions on, on the Inflation Reduction Act, but that would much more be in play if we had that outcome in 2024. So bottom line though, Nirmal, to your excellent question is, I think the, the provision of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the Inflation, the Infrastructure Act and so on, I think those are safe for the next couple of years. And that's gonna be an important period of time to make progress demonstrating the benefits of that legislation to the American people, getting the money out there and deploying it to get steel in the ground and emissions falling and to demonstrate success. That's a very important next couple of years uh, to make that happen. Thank you. Um, so our next question is from uh, Zach Coleman. Hi, thanks for doing this call. Zach Coleman with Politico. Um, had a question about loss and damage. Um, John Kerry has said um, he thinks that China should be contributing uh, to loss and damage finances to funds. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, one, does like the U.S. even have a moral high ground to suggest that China should be contributing? And two, is that is that actually in play uh, to to you know bring in countries that um, are you know developing in many respects, but will be contributing a bulk of the emissions going forward into the contributor context uh, of of loss and damage? Let let me throw it to Kave to start on this one. Um, thanks a lot for the the question. I, I think it's a it's a really good one. I mean, I, I, the first thing I would say is it's it's just really interesting to see how loss and damage has progressed from being a fairly obscure agenda item in the negotiations for a number of years, even um, decades, that has been pushed largely by the small islands and, and the least developed countries to now being something which is at the top of the agenda. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is, frankly, that the negotiations around Paris are largely over. And secondly, because we're seeing increasing impacts around the world and not just in the developing world combined with a trajectory that's far too pedestrian in terms of reducing emissions so i think for all those reasons it's uh, it's got, it's moving up the agenda and i would also say that there's been really a marked change as a result of that in the way that developed countries have engaged in on this issue including the united states which i think has been much more constructive in in having conversations around it um, on your point, I think it's a really it's a it's a really interesting one because it really depends on how you look at issues of uh, of equity and the use of atmospheric space today. I mean, I was just speaking to Nat about this just before we jo joined the call. I mean, if you take it in terms of absolute emissions, then of course the G two and the G three, so um, the US, China, EU would be directly in the frame. But if you look at it in terms of per capita emissions, it throws up all sorts of interesting anom anomalies and countries that you would never think of would be right up there. Um, uh, and then if you look at per capita, uh, uh, sorry, and so GP, you know, um, per, per capita emissions at the moment in China, I think are half of what they are in the US. But then if you look at cumulative historic emissions, then China is not even currently in the top 20 when you look at it on a per capita basis but over time all of that is going to change um, in the sense that that china will certainly become uh, dominant in terms of uh, of total emissions not just current but also um, in terms of uh, cumulative emissions at some point so i don't think we're going to end in a world that really uh, is going to be allocating 
uh, responsibility for finance along those terms, because I think it just would be non-negotiable. But what is very clearly emerging, and I think there's there's really a consensus around this, is that we do need more finance that will address impacts that you cannot mitigate or cannot be adapted to. And that is going to need to, um, to have financial input that is from a number of sources. And the Paris Agreement does not focus, it says that developed countries should take the lead, but it also opens the door for other countries who have capacity to do that. And the South-South uh, cooperation from China is enormous. I think the I think China is now the largest holder of developing country debt um, uh, as a country. I, might, I may be wrong with that, but I think it's a good question. And, um, and I think what it points to is that we're not going to be heading towards a formulaic outcome like that. But what we are going to see is an acknowledgement that the most vulnerable countries around the world are going to need help to deal with impacts that can't be adapted to. And that is going to have to extend to way beyond just public sector finance from governments. It's going to have to involve the entire economy, shifting financial flows in, a, in alignment with the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions. I do want to note we will uh, try to be wrapping this up uh, in another seven minutes, so at quarter to the hour. Um, so we'll uh, try to go through these a little more quickly. Um, so the next is from uh, Sarah from E&E. Hi, Sarah Schoenhart from E&E &E News. Um, just a clarity on the agenda item on loss and damage. I, I understand that developing countries are pushing pretty hard for a finance facility or fund. And so if it is put on the agenda, but not in those terms. I just wonder how that might set the tone for negotiations. Um, and if I can ask also what you anticipate might be some potential spoilers this year. This is maybe for, for both um, Nat and Cave in terms of you know, geopolitics between Russia and the rest of the world and Saudi Arabia and the United States. Um, what what spoilers we might potentially see tying up or increasing tensions at the talks. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry I couldn't catch up with you in, in DC. I can't see Nat, so I'm just going to jump in here. Um, on the agenda item, I think my my, my bet is a negotiation. My best guess is that we we are going to have an agenda item agreed, but I don't think we are going to be in a situation where facilities agreed to at this stage. Uh, I, I don't see the political conditions there. Uh, amongst developed countries to go down that route. Um, I, I think as long as that there's a, a clear road ahead for how this will be resolved with a timeline for a decision, then that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the finance wouldn't flow uh, any quicker. As I said, agreeing to the GCF took over five years to operationalize. So not necessarily agreeing to establish something now doesn't mean that it's going to be slower in the end. So I think the good there's a good will there, and as, as as others have mentioned, Secretary Kerry has been sort of forward leaning on this issue. In terms of spoilers for the COP, um, it's always easy to write a bad story rather than <laughs> a good news story. But I think the biggest challenge for this COP is that it's actually not about the negotiations. Even Glasgow, really, this, the big story wasn't about the negotiations. It was about the two weeks before and all of the announcements that were happening around that. So the real the real challenge for the presidency here is how do you show progress when the entire system is always pivoted around the drama of a final plenary, when this COP was never asked to deliver something of significance in the negotiations? It, it's about the pivot to implementation, and that is a I think is, is a much harder story to write um, than something going wrong in the final plenary over an obscure agenda item. And I'll just say briefly on spoilers. I mean, the if, if you're thinking uh, about e external developments, right? I mean, of course, some of those are impossible to predict. I think the one that folks that will probably get undue attention is the midterm elections in the U.S. And as we discussed, I think I mean one important thing to 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 be clear on will be that, as I said, that the even if the midterm elections go against President Biden and the Democrats, um, that doesn't change. The, that doesn't suddenly undermine. Or under, uh, you know, uh, uh, or 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 change the outlook for the Inflation Reduction Act in the near term, and I think that will be important because, of course, there there's likely to be significant attention to that, and and maybe even over attention for the purposes of the COP um, while we're in Sharm El Sheikh. 
All right, thanks, Nat. Um, so we got a question via chat from uh, Catherine Monahan at Carbon Pulse. She's asking, uh, could you please um, could you please respond to how forest and land conservation is likely to feature into this year's COP? I mean, I'll just say very quickly, and Kava, you may you can speak to the negotiations. This is obviously a big part of the action agenda in some respects, uh, and I think that you'll see some things continuing on um, from last year. Um, for example, last year, there were a couple of big announcements on um, jurisdictional red, on trop uh, reducing tropical deforestation. Uh, as some of you I've talked with about, I've been involved in some of that, the LEAF Coalition, which was announced uh, in April and then uh, and then sort of re-upped at the COP. We have seen significant progress in LEAF, and so I think you'll likely see some in that action agenda piece. I don't know whether it'll be a blockbuster announcement, but some uh, continued announcements about progress in those spaces. And of course, I think the forest and land conservation agenda generally has gotten a boost with the election of Lula in Brazil. Um, we'll see how that plays out, but I think that will be a tailwind in the, in the sense of, of optimism and outlook. But Kavi, I don't know if you want to add more specifically on other aspects of the negotiations. Nothing from me, just the, the, there's a number of items that, uh, that relate to land use and they'll be doing their technical thing, but it won't be making headlines. Okay, so we'll uh, get into, we'll get uh, ask Jeffrey Lean to raise his question. Hi, uh, Jeffrey Lean, freelance these days. Um, historically, cops have worked when China and America have worked together, and they haven't worked when they're at odds to generalize. How are relations between China and America on climate at the moment? And how are they affected by the Pelosi trip to Taiwan? And if you have time to comment on where things stand on the methane pledge, which is perhaps the most important thing of all, I'd be glad of that as well. Thanks, I, I'll, I'll take that on very quickly. I, I think it, you're right historically, of course, and I think in particular in the lead up to Paris uh, in 2015, the, the um, the good progress that, that President Xi and President Obama had made from 2013 on was really important in building trust that allowed for the breakthrough in some of the language in Paris. I, I think to some extent, I don't want to say it's un, it's un, that relationship is unimportant because, of course, the relationship between the G2, the two by far largest emitters in the world, is critical on climate change overall. Um, but for the reasons that Cave discussed, there's no negotiating text, there's no breakthrough that we're looking for, there's no uh, word set of words to be moved past uh, and so I think relative to sort of you know what we saw in in, in Paris or the, the inverse to some extent in Copenhagen I don't think there's a uh, there is a big breakthrough needed here that would require coordination at the negotiating table so I think it's the answer is really what you see is the broader it, this is you know I, I don't think you need us to tell you that um this is a challenging that there are challenges across the board in terms of the U.S. China relationship and I and I think um, we've we've also seen the the impact of of the um, of the trip that uh, that the speaker took. Um, I don't think that is particularly um, more true for climate than for anything else. But I think we have what we have seen is a shift. Whereas before, climate was a bright spot often, even and it was a place that the two countries could work productively on, even as they had challenges elsewhere. We're not seeing that as much now. It's it's a more challenging across the board relationship. Having said that, I know that Secretary Kerry remains very focused on this and remains in close touch. Um, and you know, we saw in Glasgow last year um, that despite those challenges, uh, the US and China were able to make uh, some positive announcements. So I wouldn't rule it out for sure, but I, 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 again, I don't think climate is a particularly, it, it, it's, it's part of, it's bound up in the broader set of issues between the US and China that, that I think are more challenging now uh, than they were um, perhaps seven years seven years ago. Uh, I think on the on the methane pledge, I don't have anything specific. I mean, we are obviously that I agree that that is a critical issue. I think, like many things, the the challenge there is implementation, right? That is, it's it's echo an echo of what Kave said about the broader negotiations. Uh, what we need across the board. So many good things coming out of Glasgow last year. I need to make sure that we are implementing those and realizing their potential. So, so Nat may have to run here. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I think we can just field uh, Doug's final question, and and probably, hopefully, if Nat has to go, uh, Kave can take it. Hi, thanks. Just uh, per the point here that there are not huge breakthroughs expected. Um, sometimes I know these discussions. Uh, it's it's about 
the COP as a venue for things to happen as much as what happens in a formal negotiation. Are there any steps that you might foresee, whether they're coming from countries, uh, you know, big countries like China or from private industry? Are there, are there important announcements where we might expect uh, to see them surface, you know, during the COP as opposed to being explicitly part of the talks? Thanks. Yeah, I, I can I can just come in very quickly. I think that's a really good question. And I think it's really good that you're asking it, because, as I say, I think this this COP will be a challenge to report on in terms of what is the story. But you have the, the world leaders um, meeting at the beginning of the COP. I understand the president will probably uh, join later in the week. Um, but you then have a number of thematic days hosted by the presidency. So you have a, a finance day on the 9th, you have a science day, a youth day, a decarbonization day. And if the trend that's happened in previous COPs, including Glasgow, continues, the focus on the action agenda is just going to get more and more. And there, there will be announcements clustered both by at the national level, but also um, at the subnational in terms of uh, companies, private sector um, uh, cities, regions, etc., around those thematic days. Similarly, the high-level climate champions are also hosting a number of thematic days in their action hub. So I would really uh, watch that space in terms of actual uh, expected deliverables. Obviously, the, the the participants who come to these cops hold them pretty tightly to their chest. So I think we're going to have to um, watch out for that. But the real challenge is for the cop presidency to to package that in a way that sends a clear signal of progress, even if the final plenary isn't the thing um, that waves around a big result like we had in Paris, which is really a once in a lifetime uh, result. The, the only thing I'll add very quickly, thanks for coming in. Good question, Doug. I think one thing that we and others are watching um, on the, is, is, the, uh, is the US, the push from the US and other countries along with philanthropy to do another one of the um, joint emissions transition partnerships, the Jet Peas. We saw that was a big announcement for South Africa last year. I think some folks, I know there's been a lot of work on um, on, on providing more granularity to the South African uh, to the South African announcement, and there has been work with other countries. I think it's premature. This stuff, as as Kavi said, it's very closely held, but it's also down to the wire. But I think that is a focus for the for for Secretary Kerry and the Biden administration. I know is is mobilizing that uh, finance, particularly around the clean energy transition, and it, and, it, and, um, and it connected with many of the themes we've talked about, the need to phase out coal on, a, on an accelerated time frame, the need to manage the current energy crisis and yet accelerate the move towards renewables. And so I think in, for a, in terms of an area where uh, there's been lots of work and, uh, and hopefully it will come to fruition, I would look there as well, the, the area around financing uh, that energy transition, uh, perhaps through, through another of uh, those partnerships. Thanks, Nat. And I think that brings us to the wrap up. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I want to remind uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, Kave and Nat will both be in the ground in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, uh, we're ready for quick reactions and, and updates uh, on the record or on background. Uh, reach out to me uh, at gerlockA at c2es.org or 517 214 7415. And uh, be sure to check out our webpage frequently. We will continue to uh, send around updates. Uh, throughout the the COP, and uh, those will come into your inbox as well. If you are on this call, I'll make sure you're on my email update list. All right, thanks very much. Thanks everyone. so much. Yep. Thanks so much, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in Sharm El Sheikh. Thank you.